Fight Club is David Fincher's second film to completely saturate pop culture upon its release. If you were around in 1999, then you simply couldn't escape the buzz and the marketing that the movie generated. So let's get to breaking the first rule of Fight Club. Welcome everyone to the Collector's Cut. I am Peter and joining me as always is David. This is our review and it's ending one minute at a time. <laughs> That's very close to uh, Vin Diesel from Fast and the Furious saying he lives his life a quarter mile at a time. I just want to point that out. You didn't have to, but I get it. <laughs> yeah, very close. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's a movie podcast. We work through franchises or sometimes the filmography of a director. We're in a David Fincher season and we are working through his films. Uh, we did uh, Seven already. We did The Game as a Patreon bonus. And here we now have Fight Club, which came Ooh. out in 1999 starring Brad Pitt and Edward Norton. Um, in some ways, it was his next big film, because the game, like, I'm sure it got a bit of buzz when it came out, but it was definitely not quite in the zeitgeist as Seven was, and then yeah. Fight Club certainly was. So um, this was definitely his next big movie. It was everywhere at the time. Uh, we'll start spoiler-free, of course, as we always do, mm -hmm. um, and we'll give you a warning before we get to the spoilers. Uh, but yes, so, yes, the, the premise of Fight Club is that Edward Norton is this bored car insurance man. I don't know the exact title of his job, but he basically goes and assesses accidents of cars and whether or not the company should spend money to, like, you know, deal with it or if it's worth the just dealing with the settlement fees. That's basically what he does. He goes out and assesses those kind of things. I think at one point his, he answers the phone and says, like, claims and liabilities as his yes. department name or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't sell car insurance. I don't want to make, I'm just making it clear that he doesn't sell yeah. car insurance. But he's... He works for the car company. Yeah. And if there's ever an issue with the car that they might have to recall, he determines whether or not it's worth it. Yes. Uh, so he eventually gets frustrated. He meets a guy named Tyler, played by Brad Pitt, and mm. they start Fight Club, which is them taking out their aggression on each other and then more people join in. And the movie kind of spirals from there, uh, shall we say. So uh, we'll get into it all, of course. I think it's, we've both seen this before, I assume. Yes, absolutely. This is, uh, I do not have a very large movie collection in terms of physical media. This is one of the few that I actually do have on DVD. Not Blu-ray, mind you. Never quite upgraded to that. So, so you watched this on DVD? I did not. No. I could have, but I'd have to find a DVD player, and that was an entire problem within its own self. Not, not that I was going to make fun of you for watching a DVD. It's just, I, I, like, I'm at a point now where I'll, I'll watch something in SD if it only exists in SD, but if I know mm. it exists in HD, like, I, I'm going to go watch the HD version. It was really kind of a problem for me of, do I want to spend the time to find where I put my DVD player after I moved? and plug it in and get all that set up? Or do I want to spend the three ninety nine dollars to rent it? And uh -huh. frankly, it spent... it Honestly, it felt a little bit weird, especially with the themes of Fight Club and how much they talk about consumerism, to spend three ninety nine dollars <laughs> to watch it. But regardless. Ah, well, what are you going to do? Uh, yeah. Yeah, all right. Well, let's just get into it then. David, mm. what are your feelings on Fight Club? Okay, little backstory. Um, oh, oh, we're going I, back, right? Wavy lanes. Yeah, we're, we're going doo -doo 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 -doo. way back. So uh, I probably first saw this movie at the ripe age of like mid-teens, like 13, 14. And you watch this movie then, and it's just about, you know, the machismo. It's about all this like, you know, the fighting and the stuff that eventually the third act gets into. It's It's just essentially a teen boy like fantasy movie. Then I went back and watched it again probably like mid twenties or so. And after not viewing it for so long, I came into it and I saw it as a completely separate movie. It is a completely different, as soon as you're able to pick up on like the larger themes, these bigger ideas, you see it in a completely different light. Then I come back to it again. Now 30. You're and 30? I, want, I am 30. I just turned 30 as of like two weeks ago of recording this. I just saw um, it. Yep. And <laughs> sitting down and watching this i i once again got 
a different reading out of it. It wasn't massively different from the 20 when I was in my 20s, but like it's it's so dense with all these different layers of the way that it presents its themes. And of course, obviously, this is a movie well known for like its twists and stuff like that. And even ignoring just looking into the different layers involving the twist, even just the themes that it presents on its surface are multi-layered and you can dive down deeper into what each of them mean. So all in all, I would say I enjoyed the movie. I definitely did like watching it. I think it's a very well done movie, but I enjoy it in a much different way than I did from my teens or even my 20s. So we have very different experiences with Fight Club. Okay. And and not so much in, like, you know, I think I saw it when I was probably in my teens as well. I, I don't think I saw it as soon as it came out. I think it was something when I started, like, actually collecting DVDs and I was mm-hmm. sort of seeking out movies I hadn't seen that were kind of big deals and meant to be important films. So I probably saw it maybe a little younger than you, but not by much. Like, I was maybe 13, 14, something in that kind of, okay. you know, earlier teens, I suppose I'm saying. Yeah. Um and I hadn't really seen it since, but this is the second time I've watched it this year because I was doing mm. a top 10 project, which is a sort of monthly live stream that I do now where I do my top 10 of a year. But before I do it, I watch like five movies I've not seen before. Mm. Separate from that, though, sometimes I might rewatch a few things if my, me- you know, it's been a long time. I can't really explain why I like it or if I if I'll even remember if I like it or whatever. And I wanted to watch Fight Club again for that a few months ago because... It's obviously a big deal from that year, and I wanted to mm-hmm. see, you know, how do I feel about it? Do I feel the same way that I did back then? I wanted to check. Um, so this is now the second time I've watched it in, like, I don't know, three months, something like that. Um, okay. And um, my feelings in the film have not changed that much since my initial experience. I definitely agree with what you're saying, and I definitely recognize a lot more in it, you know, watching mm. it, you know, with, with adult eyes and sort of, having spent the last you know decade and a half or whatever of analyzing movies and thinking about movies and and looking Mm. at it and all these things but uh, fundamentally i come out with the same conclusion is that i just don't like it that much (laughs) so all right all right um this is going to be the hot take david fincher episode because i have never liked fight club i double checked earlier this year before i did a top 10 in 1999 still Mm -hmm. didn't really like it that much and because I just watched that a couple of months ago, I'll be honest, it was a bit of a chore to get through it again today for the purpose of this review. But I had yeah, I to, so I did mm-hmm. it. But, you know, we're here. And that's not to say that I don't recognize that it has merit and I don't recognize all these layers and all how intricate it is with everything it's doing with its characters and the amount mm-hmm. of little things that it sets up in the first like act or whatever that start paying off in all these surprising ways later on. All that's right. there. There's clearly craft. I'm not saying it's poorly made. I am not saying that it's not got a lot of subtext or anything like that. There's just something about this that I just don't like. And it's, 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 so it's really hard to critique in that sense, but I, yeah. I, I guess it comes down to like a feeling, a vibe. Um, you know, the fact that the opening titles have this like techno music playing over it. There's just like <laughs> an edgy, like obviously this is 1999, but we're kind of like, I feel like this kind of ushered in the style that would be the early 2000s. And mm. I feel like that vibe that it has is something I just don't like very much. And I, it always feels like it is kind of edgy. And I get that it's edgy in a satirical way. And, you know, that's clearly the point. It's, this right. is not, you know, David Fincher is not a teenager here making this, even though this clearly appeals to teenagers for all the wrong reasons. I, I tell mm. you, you know, you ask someone in 2002, 2003, their favorite movies, and they say Fight Club and Donnie Darko. Like, yeah. you, you, I, you know, I stay away from them. <laughs> Here's the thing. I was that kid. Like, I fully, ad- I of fully admit to course, being that kid. Of course you were. But that's, that's when I, when I was saying that when I got to my twenties, I had a different viewing of it. I think I more or less lined up more with you. Not in that I thought it was bad. I didn't think it was bad really, but I did think that it was this really like hyper edgy thing that I was just growing out of at that point. I was mm. coming out of that and I was like, yeah, no, this doesn't really work as much but i think the biggest change for me is that the first act of this movie i I say act the first major chunk of this movie is a lot of setup for things that don't have to do with brad pitt's character it is he doesn't come in until a good like 
30 minutes into the movie, if even. Mm. And I think when I first started watching it as a teenager, I was so bored at that part. I was so like, hey, when are we going to get to the Fight Club part? That's the part I want to see. What's so funny about you saying that is that I think the first chunk is probably the, the best part of the movie. <laughs> right. Nowadays, I watch that and I'm like, no, I'm so much more engaged with this part of it because once Brad Pitt shows up, it just becomes edginess. And the only reason that now watching it this time that I think that it's actually a little bit better than when I watched it in my 20s is that I can recognize the satirical nature of what Brad Pitt's character is, but I can also understand the deeper themes that he's supposed to represent rather than just the edginess of it. Mm. Yeah. No, I like, that's the thing. I'm not saying that I think it's bad or that I don't get that it's doing all these things. Mm. I just, I don't like the vibe of the movie fundamentally. Yeah, I that. And, I don't, and I don't know if I love necessarily like, like Edward Norton, I'm kind of hit and miss on. I'm not sure necessarily how I feel about him. Um, and I've never liked Helena Bonham Carter. Admittedly, that's because she's usually tied to Tim Burton. So there's a little yeah. bit of a an association there in my brain that that kind of, you know. Yeah. But it, still, like I, I, you know, I'm not necessarily into the vibe of this movie. And I want to point out here, I'm not going to say what the show is because it would spoil this movie and that show, right? Mm -hmm. But there is definitely a show that has existed since Fight Club that has borrowed a lot from it that is definitely very heavily inspired by Fight Club that I do love. And okay. I think is much better than Fight Club. I'm acknowledging its existence now before anyone in the comments says, hey, but you like this thing. Yeah, because I like the characters in that more. I like how it tells its story and it steams more. Hmm. Um, so, you know, and, and I think when I watched this for the first time, I remember just thinking it went, it got really weird in the third act. Like, w w like what the Fight Club becomes, I just remember feeling weird about the first time. And I think I still feel weird about it now. There's just, there's, there's this escalation that, I get yeah. thematically what it's doing, but it just kind of feels that we're going through like a series of things escalating without much kind of rhyme or reason. I don't know. I, I think that they did a good job and it's hard to talk about without spoiling anything, but I do think they did a good job of explaining how we get there. I think that it's a problem in the movie that there is this sort of blurriness to the time that passes. Well, no, no, we're told on. that it's okay. you, you miss. I, I, I'm not talking about like how it happens. Like, I'm not talking mm -hmm. about the logistics of it. I'm just simply talking about how it feels watching the movie, where it's about this thing, and then it kind of pivots, and we're doing uh, this okay. now. Like the logistics of it, and like them being able to explain how the dots connect after the fact is irrelevant to me. I don't really care. Mm -hmm. It's more how it feels in terms of like what I'm experiencing with the movie what like you know what i'm engaging on this is the the setup you've given me these are the rules we're playing with and now we're doing this and i've always like and i've watched it twice this year and both times yeah. there's a there's a turning point in this movie which we'll get into later that mm -hmm. where i just start to like i wasn't loving it before then but that's definitely where i start to kind of feel like okay like i'm just kind of like going through the motions now to to get to the you know the conclusion stuff but you know, mm. we'll get into all that properly. I just wanted to give sort of broad yeah, feelings. Yeah, no, I get you. I, I mean, I can agree with what you're saying there. I think that's reasonable. Um, but the one thing that I think is the major unifying thing that has managed to stretch over all of my viewings is this idea of, and it's it's what the movie is trying to get across here, I believe, is this idea of what does it mean to be a man? Like when someone says, hey, just like man up or, you know, come on, be a man. What does that entail? Like, what is masculinity nowadays? How can it be represented and such like that? And I think this movie does a good job of diving into things and really examining this idea of self-acceptance and like how you manage to come to this conclusion. And again, I'm trying not to spoil anything, but you come to this conclusion of what is really important to you is more important than these sort of larger societal things, you know? It's a movie, I, I think it's very easy to put it into a, a list of movies that maybe go alongside something like Taxi Driver, because Taxi Driver is very mm. much this, you know, and I'm sure someday we'll probably, you know, I mean, we almost did a Scorsese season, you know, just finish yeah. or won the vote. Uh, but uh, I also watched Taxi Driver earlier this year, but Taxi Driver... <laughs> It deals with the idea of like toxic masculinity and the idea of 
exploring that type of character in a modern version you might refer to him as an incel or someone who could become a mass shooter or something like that right um but taxi driver i think is a phenomenal film i think it it deals with these subjects and gets into the character's head in a way that i find to be very engaging um mm. to, to watch whereas this movie there's kind of a an energy about it that i don't really like and it's kind of like a hyperactive thing that it's got going and, I, and it, this is just even down to editing and transition is like the opening scene and there's this awful really aged cg moment where the yeah. camera goes down outside a building to go down in the, the parking area where there's a van and it's showing you that there's explosives in the van down the bottom. And this isn't a spoiler. This is the opening scene. This is just kind of like what it yeah. teases at the start. But the camera goes from like, you know, this, this sort of uh, upper floor on this like corporate building and the camera swishes down and goes all the way down under the street and then into where the van is. And it's a CG transition because of the way the camera moves, it has to be CG. And Fincher mm-hmm. did experiment with this in a few films around this time period. He clearly loved the idea of doing this um but it looks really bad but that's not my problem it's not so much that it looks bad although that does stick out it's more this idea of the oh the camera's going to speed up and move to this other location very quickly um or we're going to do a lot of hyper editing we're going to do a lot of quick cuts it's very uh frenetic i guess and yeah i think it just doesn't quite um work for me I think some of the ideas in it I clearly like because I've liked other things tackling the same themes, the same subjects, even very similar plot and like uh, twists even. But there's just something about this which I obviously works for a lot of people. But it's this this combination of the of the time period, the style at the time, and just what it's doing that it just adds up to something i just don't find that pleasant to watch and it's yeah. just what it is no i i get it i absolutely because it is very stylistic mm. stylistically unique i should say and that it may not have the same sort of, as we were talking in seven the same sort of like identity where it's like purely this and this alone is what seven is this is mm. more of a combination of factors all coming together to form what the movie fight club is in terms of editing and pace like you're saying honestly i think the closest thing that i can compare it to is kind of like the modern youtube like informative video style of editing where you have like a guy (laughs) talking to the camera and then it just like randomly cuts about to a bunch of different things it makes sure that it never loses your attention before cutting to the next thing very quickly and there's always a bunch of like little funny info things on screen or they have the character breaking the fourth wall and talking directly to the audience sort of stuff that's an interesting comparison i can see that actually mm-hmm. um so anyway but we'll you know we'll get into all this in more details we'll get to spoilers i think you know we'll, we'll run down some of the other notable cast members we mentioned yes. edward norton and brad pitt of course mm-hmm. um meatloaf is in here in a fairly large supporting role uh he's good i like him he's, he's there yep. um we mentioned helibana carter of course um mm-hmm. we also have a young jared leto popping in for a, a small role oh god it's, it's I, so i was watching this with my girlfriend who had not seen it before mm-hmm. and she she saw the names pop up she's like oh helena bada carter and she likes her and then the next name on the list was jared leto and she's like what <laughs> he's in this movie i'm like not nearly as much as you think so but yes Although somehow seeing him with bleach blonde hair in this time period just feels like it fits who he is as a person. Oh, absolutely. It just fits. Um, I'm trying to find another name here. The, the IMDb cast list on Ionly is in order of appearance or something. Mm. <laughs> so it's getting hard to find him. Uh, but there's an actor who would later work with Fincher again on Mindhunter. Uh, Holt, Holt um, McAnally. Mc- or McMal- Mc- McCallany. McCallany, thank you. That's the one. There you go. Um, who's credited and this is the mechanic uh but he is in main hunter he's very good and that is kind of interesting seeing him be much younger so but if you know main hunter mm. you might spot him he's, he's popped up in other movies as well but that's kind of like where he got his like his biggest role that i can think of yeah. so yeah there's some notable faces uh sprinkled mm-hmm. in there um notably i didn't see our favorite fbi agent slash corrupt cop oh you mean flash from batman begins no yeah but I, I didn't see him in here Maybe after the last two movies, he just, like, Fincher's like, you know what, this guy's a prick. I'm not working with him again. Which, funnily enough, lines up with Nolan taking him. Nolan took him on for for Memento yep. and kept him on for Batman Begins a few years later. Maybe that was just a thing. He switched his contract over to Nolan. 
He's just like, I got a good feeling about this guy. Yeah, no, the Finch has had a... It's not like his career's nosedived in the, the, the time no. since either, but yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, so we got that. We have... Um, yeah, you know, on top of the 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 score, which is mm. kind of there's some pulsing stuff, the stuff that is more like kind of like techno music at times, uh, mm. but there is more moody elements to it. There's also a, a, a fairly selection of like popular songs that's in there, yeah. um, you know, uh, which you'll you'll recognize as you listen to the movie. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know what else I want to say without getting spoilers. I'm just trying to think of anything right, else to talk yeah. about. Uh, so, uh, I think I think an interesting concept for it, um, as the trivia states here, is that the writer of the movie, Chuck, I always mess this up, Palaniuk, Palaniuk, whatever it is, uh, the entire reason that this concept came in, because he wrote the book, was that he showed up to work one day and nobody was acknowledging the fact that he was covered in like bruises because he got uh, attacked at a, on a camping trip the weekend before. And everyone was just kind of talking around it nobody wanted to do that and i think that's interesting as a background info to then interpret how this movie con like continues with this thing of how do people react when they aren't personally invested in something because these aren't you know family and friends or anything these are just random co-workers and you know they're not asking oh my god are you okay what happened they're just like Hey, Chuck, how was your weekend? Like the most blase sort of talking points, I guess, the water cooler talk. How does it look like it went, Bill? Yeah. <laughs> well, Bill, not great. Would you like to hear more? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's give the spoiler warning so we can actually mm -hmm. talk about everything in it without having to worry about accidentally spoiling any twists or anything because there is, yeah. uh, you know, a couple of notable ones. Uh, which again, you know, rather than going through order, we'll probably tackle it based on subject, and I think that's the first thing we should talk about. So, mm. spoilers, just I'll warn you again, just before I say this. Uh, so, the reveal, of course, that Brad Pitt is just um, another personality of Edward Norton's character in this. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we sort of go the whole movie without hearing the narrator's character name. It kind of just dances around it the whole time. Mm. So it turns out that the name of Brad Pitt, Tyler Durden, is also Edward Norton's name. Like, that is also his his title. So, yep. um, I think the things that stick out to me watching this now is, like, how kind of obvious this twist is from a certain point in the movie. Mm. Like, as soon as, as soon as the Brad Pitt side of this personality starts having sex with Helena Bonham Carter's character... Right. Pretty much from that point on, like... Like I mean, I, I don't remember like my first viewing. Like, w if I predicted Same. it, uh, when yeah. I predicted it, if I did, I don't know. I have no idea. So I, 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 I have no idea. But watching it now, like as soon as we get to that point, and it's sort of like dancing around, like um, you know, her saying things like "Who are you talking to?" and or "What do you mean we?" Like "Who's we?" You know, there's mm. just all these little things um that it's kind of like dancing around so that you can kind of like it's it, it's intentionally sort of obviously giving you clues that there's something awry here with the, what you're seeing on screen right see i'm actually going to disagree with that i think uh -oh. that i think that yes there are obviously these clues and when you go back and watch it you're sitting there thinking oh god how did i not get this the first time but i think that knowing the twist knowing that it's coming and i was looking at each of these little hints that were given they word them and they have them play off in very specific ways to make it so that there is a way that you can interpret it the first time. For instance, when he says, you know, this we thing, obviously he's talking about him and Tyler, but the way the conversation is structured, it sounds like he's talking about himself and Helena Bottom Carter as well. It's, it can go either way. See, this is such a murky discussion because we can't remember the first viewing and i acknowledge yeah. that and i well, acknowledge, and I, I acknowledge what i'm about to say uh -huh. is based on the fact that it's in a world where fight club exists but other things that have pulled a similar twist are painfully obvious because all these little things you're talking about where oh you can read it this way they're mm. all painfully obvious to me now like even if oh, it's yeah. something new that i've not seen before like the way you handle the fact that one of the characters isn't really there or one of the characters is like this you know the two people are actually the, the one person 
Yeah. The way that you handle that and the way it's handled in this movie, like, all the tell signs are kind of there now. They're, they're almost cliches and tropes uh, at this point, right. right? And I'm not knocking the movie for that. But what I'm saying is it's very, very hard to imagine a scenario where I'm watching this for the first time and I don't at least suspect something's up with the way it's handled. Like, even just the fact that Brad Pitt says to Edward Norton, um, whatever you do, don't talk to her about me. Like, that right there is this huge kind of, like, red flag of, yeah. that's really fishy. Why why on earth would he not want him to talk to her unless it's going to reveal through conversation that he's, you know, not real or that he's a figment of his imagination? Like, mm-hmm. it, you know, like, things like that really stick out when you're watching it um, yeah. now. Yeah, and I, I agree that the don't talk is to her about me, that is the biggest flag. That's the biggest one that should throw up something because there is no real good in-story reason why that shouldn't happen. And from a meta sense, you start questioning why would he say that? So I agree with that. What I think this movie does well comparatively to other films that have the same sort of twist is that throughout the movie, they repeatedly, A, show Tyler and Edward Norton, I guess Brad Pitt and Edward Norton, on screen at the same time and like interacting with other characters it's not just them by themselves like both of them are in rooms with other people and it seems like they're having three-way discussions they are but if you if you're paying attention you'll notice that they kind of swap there's there's definitely parts where it's like okay one personality is in control and then it shifts Mm -hmm. to the other one but again if you know what you're looking for you can spot like how they've sort of exactly but i think going into it blind that's the sort of thing that's keeping you off guard because i think for a lot of these other movies they specifically have it be like oh only one person is around at any given time or oh specifically one character's hanging back a lot further I, I, i think it's the sort of thing though where if you if you've been tipped off another scene though to me at least my my brain is like okay you're intentionally trying to give me other things here to to you know dissuade me, me to make me think that I'm I'm a fool for thinking that you're trying to trick me, and yeah. I sort of like tackle the scenes on that level, I guess. Um, in fact, one of the, one of the little moments that I think is also a big tell sign is that it's the, after the night where Brad Pitt and Helena Bonham Carter's characters have been having sex, and Edward Norton wakes up not knowing that's happened. He sees a condom in the in the toilet, and he mm. goes down and has his breakfast. And Helena Bonham Hart's character comes out and Edward Norton turns around and says, what the, why are you in my house? Why are you Mm -hmm. here? And she looks at him and goes, huh? Like that reaction, I feel like does definitely suggest that she's like, why is this man that I've just spent the night with now angry at me in the morning that I'm in his place? Like, because obviously he should know why I'm here, right? Right. We're spending the night together. That's like one of the ones where I'm like, I'm trying to imagine how you're meant to read that without knowing that side of it. For me, the way that I think it works is because the entire first part of this movie builds up this antagonistic relationship that the two have. And Mm. so not knowing for certain that uh, Edward Norton's character had sex with her, you build up this idea of, oh, well, he's just pissed off that she's there. And then from her perspective of things, it's just a thing of this is purely sex. This is nothing to do. Like as soon as we're done, she's gone. Like that isn't a thing where she's allowed to just hang out afterwards. That's the way that I read it, at least as sure. someone who was seeing, trying That's to see like, both sides of it. Again, I prefaced this all with, I don't remember my first Same. viewing and how I, Same. you know, how I felt about these moments, so on, so on. Mm-hmm. I, I can only come at it from this perspective. So I'm not trying to say that, this can all work and not tip off the the audience. And I think, you know, when I've seen this done elsewhere, when I talk about the show that kind of like does something similar, mm-hmm. um, I won't say what it is because I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't seen it, but the show actually knows that you're going to guess it, right? The show predicts that and uses that in a way that's, you know, it's all it almost makes an art out of it, right? And I finally it, figured out what show you were talking about. Very good. It took me a minute. <laughs> yeah. And it kind of like, it, it, the great thing about it is that it actually has this like other thing in the chamber like it's because mm-hmm. you're gonna know smartly oh i figured this out so and so is not real and then it hits you with something else that no one saw coming and it intentionally like all like been able to predict the fight club style twist is the red herring almost because right. it, it, it's like not preparing you for what the other thing is and I, I, I don't know like something about like all this and maybe it's just because this one is so like it's so heavy in clues because there's so many moments where it has to kind of dance around 
like what the twist is whereas when you look at other movies that have like really famous twists and i don't want to spoil anything from any movies yeah. but when you think of something that say the sixth sense right um mm-hmm. when you watch that movie for a second time knowing where it's going you appreciate all these little things that you read in one way like you say the first time and then the second time you can go oh that's what's really good on here that's what's whatever Mm-hmm. But it's a very short list when you actually look at the movie. It's a very, you know, it's a short half dozen key moments that have very specific meaning that feel not only like they can be read two ways, but they're very dramatic moments in and of themselves. Like, um, I, like I said, I don't want to spoil it, so I'll give it away. But like, there's yeah. moments where it feels like a big deal even the first time for like, dr- like for emotional character growth reasons. And then the second time, it changes what the character moment means. It changes right. entirely. Whereas here, I would say that a lot of these little moments, it's more just about concealing the secret. And it doesn't necessarily add like a, a cool second thing to it when you watch it a second time. It's just still just kind of concealing the secret. And it works. It's still functioning. And it's, you know, what it's saying, it's, what it's doing and what it's setting up. But mm-hmm. it's not necessarily adding that extra cool like layer to it where oh, now this scene means something different to Edward Norton's character. You know, that now right. now, now this feels like it's it's about him. You know, oh, I mean, obviously, the macro of it is, like, obviously the idea that he's created this character that he can be instead of his boring Ikea-loving self is mm-hmm. the big part of the movie. It's, you know, it's, it's this ultra-masculine, free, you know, free from the shackles of society character who can do what he wants that he's created. Right. Like, obviously, that all makes sense, but, you know... Mm-hmm. And that's, I, I really do think that that's partly because of the fact that he is this alternate identity rather than his own individual character. That's why there can't be those big emotional moments. That's why that's it, like, because no matter what happens, it needs to either happen between him and a real person or between him and Tyler. You can't have the moment of Tyler and a real person and it impacting edward norton's character in the same way yeah yeah i guess what's so neat about this and this is the last time i'll bring up the show that i will not name um (laughs) but i'm going to bring it up once more just to make this point is that sometimes i'll say the ids are all great i just don't like the execution Mm -hmm. and i think in this case it's actually very good that i can point to something else and say no like i know that's the case here because this is the execution that i like over here I've seen this done in a way that speaks to me, that works for me, and like nails the feeling. And I, I get invested in how it plays with the the dynamics of the the two personalities and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, yeah, I so, get that. You know, I guess I, the, I, the biggest thing for me for this entire conversation is that on the first viewing, I'm sure I was like, "Oh my god, what a twist!" Or maybe I already had it spoiled. Honestly, I can't remember. But nowadays, I don't think the twist matters really like it in terms Mm. of watching the entirety of the plot of this movie i'm much more heavily invested with the themes and the ideas that it's trying to cover i think that that is far more interesting than the idea of oh yeah no turns out they're the same person all along like that's maybe it's because i've had the twist already in my head i knew it was going in so i didn't care about it but i was so much more interested in like we were saying the first part of this movie where he's going to these uh, meetings for essentially a lot of like terminally ill people, people that are very emotionally vulnerable and therefore allow him to be emotionally vulnerable. I think, well, sh- well don't just throw that out there. Let's explain yeah, yeah. that a little bit better. So mm-hmm. um, the start of this movie is that he's got insomnia. And when he goes to the doctor for, and the doctor says, look, this is not that serious. I'm not going to give you anything strong. What you need is natural sleep. And he basically says, look, what you've not you've got is not a big deal. There's a meeting every Thursday over there for men with testicular cancer. Go there yep. and tell me you've got an actual problem. So he does go to the meeting and he discovers that he basically I won't say gets off on because he's not getting aroused, but mm-hmm. he basically gets satisfaction and emotional fulfillment out of being around other people crying and confessing their their deepest darkest fears. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's what I was getting to was that he gets this fulfillment. This is for the first part of the movie before he ever gets introduced to Tyler ever gets introduced to even Marla at this point, Helena Bonham Carter's character. He is satisfied. 
he has gotten the thing he's looking for. He has re been able to unload his emotional frustrations in obviously a way that is not the same way that he well, should. Let, let, let me way, phrase but... it in a very specific way that I think is important mm -hmm. to the themes of the movie. Yeah, He finds fulfillment in effectively living through someone else. Yeah, I right? think someone else, and... but it's still well, the but... same emotions coming out. It's still his. Well, yeah, but that's the point, though, is he, he's, he's, he's using other people to sort of channel it and then ultimately, the extension of that afterwards is to create his own personality that's separate, that he thinks is separate, mm -hmm. that he can live through. Like, that's the, 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 the knock-on effect from that. And that, that's like, yeah, idea-wise, that's all solid. That's fine. Yeah, no, but that's what I really like is that if he had stayed in that path, if he had continued to go on to these group therapy things and found this level of deeper emotional satisfaction, I don't think then this hyper-machismo, super... Uh, masculine Brad Pitt showing up would have actually had the same effect. I think that it would have been a problem of, no, I don't... Like, if he had found a way to release his emotions healthily, I don't think Fight Club has the same appeal to him. I don't think Brad Pitt spouting off all this stuff has the same appeal to him. I think that it's only because it catches well, him... Hold on a second, hold on a second. Okay, are, you, are, you, are you insinuating that him going to these meetings is him like being healthy with his emotions because it is not this is i don't think it's been being <laughs> healthy with his emotions no but i do think it is a it is a healthier outlet because in the end what oh, is... no 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 that's this is the gateway drug this is the gateway drug to tyler this is the stepping stone to get him to that extreme i disagree i don't think so because i mean well, from okay. my perspective we could disagree my perspective, but that's the way i I'm see it, at it the way i see it is that he is in this, um, like, he's able to open up emotionally. He does the whole thing with meditation. He finds his power animal. Like, these are all things that are healthy ways to process through frustration, depression, and all those sort of things. And then he runs into Tyler. And yes, I understand that Tyler is a manifestation of himself. He is clearly still having problems. But uh, that is mostly caused by the fact that Marla has shown up. And he is unable to yeah. get that same sort of release, that well, same sort of satisfaction. Let me, out let of me it. analyze that for a second before you go mm -hmm. any further. I do think it's interesting that he effectively has his release invaded by a woman. And I think when we're talking about a movie that's talking about masculinity and the mm -hmm. idea of toxic masculinity, I think it's very interesting that a woman gets in the way of what he wants and then he oh, goes yeah. and creates this other personality to, to fulfill it. But I would I would like to reiterate that I would not throw the word healthy around anything he's doing with these meetings. It is it is almost downright evil what he is doing. It is manipulative. And so, so no, I... And obviously, we should also acknowledge that, yes, there are quick flashes of Tyler, like, as mm -hmm. if he's already kind of like, you know, the, the, the seed's already in his brain somewhere for, for this to come later. But. but the flashes only show up when he's at his worst in terms of insomnia. When he's after the point where he starts going to the meetings, the flashes don't show up again until he is on until uh, Helena Bob Carter starts showing up and starts robbing him of it again. Okay, technically that's true, although I would almost I don't really want to watch it again, but I'd almost <laughs> want to go back and actually check how accurate that statement is because it felt more like to me the flashes were happening when he was being challenged the most, when he was frustrated the most, but. That's fair. Uh, but I'll concede that I don't remember the specific moments well enough to actually argue that point. Uh, that was just my general feeling as I was no, yeah, I got seeing you. them. Um, but no, so the the reason I bring up that Helen Bonham Carter here is at these meetings is I agree. I think that it is the fact that she is a woman is what kind of primes him for this yeah. super masculine, super misogynistic uh, Brad Pitt to show up and basically tell him like, you're not a real man. Real men were, you know, our fathers and such like that. We've been raised in this. We live in a society, basically. <laughs> and he, he basically just lays in and says, yeah, no, the only way that you're really going to be a man is to go back to what, like, the 50s considered to be a man. You know, you got to get into some fights. You got to got to do some go against the culture. Oh, well, yeah. And that even goes down to the fact that when Edward Norton goes home at this point and finds out that it's been burned down. And obviously it was mm -hmm. really himself as Tyler doing that. But, you know, that's right. that's a another conversation um he, he phones helena bottom carter first because he has her number and mm -hmm. then chooses 
to not talk to her and phone Tyler. So it's like almost like he's at a pathway here and he chooses Tyler instead. He chooses the unhealthy approach. But I want to make it clear that those meetings are unhealthy and then it's blocked by a woman and that makes him go even worse down a deep end. I just wanted to say, that's my read on it and I'm sticking to it. I agree that him going in and pretending to be other people and pretending to have these diseases is unhealthy behavior. What I'm hearing is that you fully endorse people who are completely well going to meetings with people with terminal illnesses and seeking enjoyment out of their misery. That's what I'm hearing. That is not my endorsement. (laughs) My, my, my thing I want to make clear here is that if I had a person come to me and say, hey, I need an outlet for my emotions, should I get into an underground boxing ring or go to a meeting with a bunch of people who are sharing their emotions. I'm going to tell them the emotional one. I'm saying it's better. I'm not saying it is the best choice. But I, no, I think what you're missing, though, is that they're both bad and the emotions are just a precursor to the fighting. It's, it's just... It, it's like the, the emotions are at a three and then the fighting is the emotions risen up to an ultra-masculine 10, right? That's kind of... It's a progression thing. I don't think it is. I think that it could have been a healthy release on his own. It was only the fact... Because we see that he goes, he talks to Helen Bomb Carter after a while and says, hey, we can't keep doing this. We need to split it up. We each are going to take our own and we'll we'll do, go our okay, separate okay. ways. We'll but never the, see each other the again. The point of that, though, is that the, the, the answer, the healthy answer... Is her the, the, is as weird as and as like caricature. I don't think the healthy she answer has ever been Helena Bottom Carter. <laughs> no, but I, in the context of the movie, because that's why the movie ends with them holding hands. This is that's mm-hmm. the happy part of the ending. Um, yeah, but the the point is is that she is equally unhealthy as him, and that they found each other. As weird as the circumstances are, that they have found each other because she's basically doing the same thing he is, and he's like spotted her and is starting to feel like she's invading his space, right? And we get into the sexism of that and the idea that, oh, a woman's ruining my, my you know, like, she's not a real gamer. Like, that kind of attitude, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and the idea is, is that when they get together, instead of, like, starting a relationship, right, and that's almost what happens when he's going to phone her instead, they mm-hmm. decide to divvy up the unhealthy portions of what, <laughs> of what they do, right? They're saying, yeah. hey, I'll take Mondays, Wednesdays, Saturdays, you take these days, whatever. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're, they're doing this, right? But he doesn't take that path. He goes down further. The point is, is that she was meant to also be the the quote unquote cure for him of also what he's already doing. It was meant to be an end of him going to these meetings. The point was, is that he found her and that mm. she was a potential healthy path forward. So we can move on no, there because I, I feel like we're just going to go in circles if we keep arguing well, this back well, and forth. All but, right, then con- continuing on that, I agree in that I think that she's the cure, but I think what it stands for more is that the correct answer here is opening yourself up to another person like don't be closed off don't be tyler durden who says you know just fight your way through everything yeah and don't be edward norton at the the the, the health meetings either (laughs) but that's what i'm saying though is that the health meetings were him opening up just he was he was there for the wrong reasons but when he (laughs) cried that was him really crying that was him getting the emotions out he specifically says he never at any point says he has these diseases he says, if you stay quiet, people assume the worst. So he comes in and people just assume they have it, but he never lies and says he has it. He's there specifically that for the emotional okay. release. That does it that doesn't make it okay. I'm, I'm not saying any of this is okay. I'm just saying that it is the, the what he is looking for is some sort of emotional fulfillment. And he almost has that in oh, these sure. meetings. He I, needs to take it further. But instead, because... Right after him and Helena Bottom Carter divvy up the things, he's sent on a job, and that's where we get the yeah, whole yeah, thing yeah. of him flying across country. He's still in Sonny at this point. He has not been able right, to sleep on, for on. as long as Helena Bottom Carter I'm has. Not, obviously, I agree he wants emotional fulfillment. That's the whole point of the movie, obviously, yes. right? Right. I am saying that the whole point, like, there's a, all these health meeting scenes foreshadow where the movie's going to go with the Fight Club stuff. It's, yes. it, it is part of the way there. It's the Fight Club is an escalation of what he was already doing with these scenes. But instead of crying together, he's veering masculine into, you know, the fighting because it's like, oh, that's manly man. That's what you do. Um, mm-hmm. It's almost like because he dared to start to feel emotional, the masculine side is coming out and like, manipulating him and that's weird to say because it's the same person but you know what i mean like in his head yeah. like it, it's it's taken over and all these awful things it's so, like him backsliding down into like an incel sort of mindset 
Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. You, you've got all that, and you've got the other stuff in the first half hour as well, which is him talking mm-hmm. about buying stuff from Ikea and how much he loves doing that. This movie is so incredibly anti-consumerism on top of the whole masculinity thing. Yes, but it's also full of product placement. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because I there was a lot of Krispy Kreme in this. It's it's a common trivia fact that every scene in this movie has a Starbucks cup somewhere. <laughs> um so like and you also get to find out what his job is and how cynical that is. Mm -hmm. um how you know depressing this office job lifestyle is but obviously and they even like like they spell it out in giant neon letters because the first time you see brad pitt not counting the opening which is like a little tease of like the ending right when it starts the story starts off proper all of those one frame splices of brad pitt the first time you see him is when edward norton's talking about sleeping and like we're going to all these different cities and he even says the line as brad pitt goes past him in the airport this is the first time you see him properly mm-hmm. he says i always wonder like what if you go to sleep and wake up as a different person when you land and like they're literally go because like, they're on the uh the conveyor belts and they're going the opposite sides yeah like, they're crossing over as if this is where we're pivoting to like I, like it spells it out in general like, I, I don't want to spoil this other movie but there's another movie that literally starts with like a shot of a pillow and it's like hey <laughs> this this might be a dream this might be someone going to sleep <laughs> we're telling you i get you. that i mean again i think it's one of those things that you're saying that this line yeah. of if you wake up as another person Yes, that's there. Yes, it's contrasted exactly with that. But it's also part of, like, a four-minute-long monologue. Oh, shit. No, I'm not saying that this is too on the nose. I'm just pointing out that when you watch this knowing, it's it's screaming it at you. And that's that's the thing with twists, is that sometimes twists should be on some level predictable, because if they they Mm -hmm. haven't seeded it, if they haven't done things like this then it's not going to be fulfilling. It's only fulfilling if, if the, the seeds are there and they're yeah. not like cheating their own rules. It's it's exactly the th- problem that uh, M. Night Shyamalan had with his later movies, where mm-hmm. he was he just threw in a twist because he's known as the twist guy, even if he wasn't properly seeding them throughout his film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So it's after um, all this where he does meet Brad Pitt on a plane, right? Mm-hmm. Finally. Uh, also, I will point out there's there's a good little laugh actually where it turns out all this narration about his job and what he does and how when there's a car malfunction that causes like a deadly crash, mm-hmm. he works out okay if this is a problem with like this entire line of cars he'll work out how much it'll cost to do the recall but then he'll also work out how much will it cost if there's okay the accident rates one in a hundred say and we have to pay the average amount of settlement like if that's less than the recall then we'll just we'll just we won't recall we'll just accept that we have to pay some settlements here or there and it cuts to this woman that he's telling this story to and she's like which car manufacturer do you work for (laughs) and he's like uh a big one he doesn't tell her (laughs) wonderful (laughs) yes anyway so uh he meets brad pitt and mm-hmm. the, and yeah everything up until this point like i'm more or less into and i kind of enjoy i think the reason why i'm not as into it once the brad pitt stuff starts it's not that i don't like the ideas it's just that like you say it's where it, it veers into edgy and i understand yeah. thematically why he's doing that but it veers into edgy and it also veers into not right away but once he starts interacting with helena bonham carter again and once there's other characters around it really starts to veer into we're being cute with hiding the twist or poking at the twist. We're being cute it. with how people react to him because they're actually reacting to the same person as Brad Pitt. Um, mm. You know, particularly when he's got a whole militia and they're saying, sir, and yes, sir, I'll, I'll, I'll let me get that for you, sir. And Jared Leto comes up and like grabs the beers out of his hand. It's, like, it's because it's also Brad Pitt who's the scarier right. one. I For so, me, um, I don't care so much about the fact they're, you know, playing, dancing around the twist. For me, the reason that from this point on it gets a little bit eh is that every, I would say, 10 minutes or so... It's a montage? No, not even a montage. It just goes into Brad Pitt reading off the manifesto of Tyler Durden Mm. for an extended period of time. And it's not even like a dialogue. It's not a thing where he's playing off of Edward Norton. It's just a long diatribe of like, here's everything wrong with men nowadays, you know? And it's like, yeah, he's, he's four shot in the character. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I understand it again, as you said, from a character perspective of what they're trying to get across here, but I feel like it could have been done a lot more subtly 
And even if they didn't want to go for subtle, it could have been done as more of a dialogue. It could have been done mm. as more of an actual scene rather than literally there's a part in this movie where everything just stops and we see Brad Pitt just giving a bit of his monologue as the camera zooms into him and starts getting all shaky. And yeah. Yeah. Like, why did we need this? What did this add to the movie? They also established that he's a part-time projectionist, and this is actually one of the things that dates the movie, because uh, obviously film projection has switched to digital for quite some time now. But Tyler Durden only works with Christopher Nolan IMAX films now. <laughs> but he uh, is a projectionist, and they explain in the movie that, um, yeah, films come in multiple reels, and they have to be switched over, and that's what the projectionist does, all on just, you know, mm -hmm. make sure everything's running well and um but they reveal here that he splices in one frame of porn in family films and yep. that's amusing but obviously it ties to all these one frame splices of uh of mm -hmm. him in the head of edward norton you know it explains that and obviously the very end of the film does have a splice of a cock just to you know yep yeah you know. funnily enough um as i was watching this with my girlfriend i was like oh did you catch that and she said no so i had to rewind just to show her that that's, was there that's funny because i because i think it's maybe you don't see what it is but because of the way it flashes it's uh, for me it's impossible not to see something flash like you just see oh, something yeah, no. you know trust me i saw him flash oh boy did i see him flash <laughs> well i wasn't speaking specifically about the penis at the end i was just saying yes. earlier on when it's just him standing there but yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah uh probably not actually brad pitt's cock i'm just going to i would suggest. hope not <laughs> that would I mean, it might be someone on set. I don't know. It's Fincher. He secretly put his own dick pic. Yep. <laughs> like, this is like, it's art. I'll put my own dick pic for the world to see, but it's art because it's in a movie. <laughs> Honestly, I, maybe not Fincher nowadays, but I could see, you know, off of seven Fincher oh? being that level of edgy, just being oh, that level yeah. of like, yeah, you guys, you guys didn't like the game. Here's what you get. It's, yeah, it's almost, yeah, because I feel like there's obviously some edgy elements to seven. But maybe, mm -hmm. yeah, this is like him getting all of his edginess out, and then he starts to dial it back with, you know, the films that come after. And then we eventually reach Benjamin Button, and he's like, oh, too far. Too far. Yeah, yeah that's way. too far. <laughs> Bring we're, it back. <laughs> that's not enough edge for most people. Nope. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, so it sets up all that. Um, mm -hmm. So he... the, the, the big turning point scene, uh, pretty much right after this, is the the bar scene, and more specifically when they leave the bar. Yeah, so, just, so he calls yeah. uh, Tyler for help when he's, his mm -hmm. place burns down. And they end up in a bar, and it's when they're leaving the bar, uh, Tyler's like, hey, just ask me. And he's like, well, ask you what? And basically, he's like saying, ask me to stay, spend the night in my place because you, you need somewhere to stay. And he eventually does. But he's obviously mm -hmm. very timid. He doesn't want to. And that's the, obviously getting at the character differences between them. Uh, yeah. But Tyler says, all right, it's fine, no problem. But just do me one favor. He's like, what? Hit me really hard. Is it what? I want you to hit me as hard as you can. And thus, Fight Club was born. Yep. Pretty much. Uh, yeah, I, I do appreciate that the first hit's really awkward and he catches him in the ear. Oh, yeah. I, I'm not sure how true it is, but I have seen little director commentary things of just like, yeah, we told him he had to throw the punch, but we left it up to Edward Norton where the punch was going to land. Mm. So he just threw it towards the ear and the reaction from Brad Pitt afterwards of, you hit me in the ear. Why would you do that is completely genuine. <laughs> he stayed in character, obviously, but like, he was like, ah, God, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Because that would hurt. Even if it's just, like, it, oh, wouldn't yeah. take, it wouldn't take that strong of a, a tap to actually hurt if you just hit someone in the ear. No, for sure. It's and just it's, all... it's also, it's beautiful to watch because it's like the most limp-wristed like punch as well. It's just like a, eh. Yeah, sort of yeah. thing oh yeah it's a far cry from five minutes later when there's a montage of them all with their shirts off like just oh, punching yeah. the show each other over oh, and over God. again um yeah so i mean that's the thing this movie is effectively about the build-up of uh underground incel group i mean that's basically what the movie yeah, is pretty much that's the thing it's like at no point in this movie do they ever really specifically talk about sex like they never talk about being attracted to women they never talk about women um, really in general outside of the fact of as an in culture of men they all feel like they're demasculated now they all feel like yeah. they aren't as manly as like they've been told they should be and they all feel like this is their way to get that back in a way but it, it, yeah it's still incel for a lot of that 
Yeah, and it spreads, and it's in like multiple cities. Um, mm. There's times where like Edward Norton will be somewhere, and like the guy serving him the you know, his pancakes will just be like, "It's on the house, sir. You definitely mm. don't have to pay for anything here." And it's just, well, that's much later on, but yeah, it does get that well, feeling. It, 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 yeah, I mean that specific example is much later on, but there's a lot of little ones that sort of start to pepper in, like even quite early on, where you know mm-hmm. some guy at his work's got a black eye and gives him a little nod, you know, things like yeah. that. There's a lot of mm-hmm. stuff that just sort of builds up over the course of the movie, and a lot of the early stuff is just the Fight Club, and um, mm-hmm. you know, I'm jumping around to because it's hard to remember the exact sequence of events, but yeah, I want it to mention. Really matter. I want to mention the scene where. So obviously Edward Norton's going to work still and he's like, you know, he's dressing worse, he's showing up with bruises and cuts, his boss mm-hmm. is clearly not happy with what he's up to. Um, he talks back to him a few times. There's a scene where he finds like a, basically the rules for Fight Club on a bit of paper and he's like, hey, what, yeah. what's, what's all this shit? And Edward Norton basically just kind of scares him into like stepping down. He but like the, bluffs his way out. But the scene I want to talk about is where <laughs> he tries to fire him, Right. Um, yep. which so he's in in the manager's office and the manager calls him in well i i think it's important to structure this is that uh this is predicated with a scene beforehand where tyler has basically started handing out homework to the members of fight club they have to go do something he's getting busy and, is what you're saying <laughs> yeah well and then one of the things here and i think it perfectly leads into this scene is that their homework is they have to start a fight with somebody and lose that is that is, is what that they right have after to do. That? I don't remember that. This being is next yeah. To that. This is directly after this. Well, it's moment. after the montage and, though of everyone else doing it though. Right. Yeah. yeah everyone yeah. else does it, but then it leads directly into this scene of him coming. He's not getting fired by his boss. He actually comes in and talks to his boss and says, "Hey, here's what's going to happen. You're going to pay me, and I'm not going to tell people how many recalls we should have done." Yeah. Yeah. He basically blackmails him with all the knowledge yeah. he has of the the car company. Mm-hmm. Um. I never got the impression, though, that he was trying to start a fight with them in this scene, just because he just immediately, like, his plan immediately is to just fight himself. Because that, that's what this scene turns into, is when the boss tries to call security, he's like, mm. I'm not going to listen to this blackmail, I'm just going to call security and get you thrown out. Edward Norton starts punching himself in the face, like, you know, as hard as he can, and then yeah. punches himself through the glass table, and then up against the shelves, and he's bleeding from his nose, he's, you know, he's in, he needs help. Yeah. And when the security guards show up, He's on his knees saying, please don't hit me, as his blood pouring out of his nose. And, the, mm. like, obviously, no one would walk in and this and think, well, he can't be faking this, because look at him, he's he's, he's yeah. so badly injured. Um, so he gets what he wants. Now, now there be he's being funded for, you know, doing no work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By the boss. It's like, I, he's getting, you know, 26 paychecks a year, he's getting unlimited, like, airfare and stuff like that, so he's able to fly wherever he wants, so... They're officially able to start the next phase of Fight Club. But one thing I did want to bring up, because I completely forgot about this scene on my rewatch, and Mm -hmm. I was actually amazed by it that I managed to forget this scene, is that just before this whole sequence, um, the only Fight Club that exists up to this point is down in the basement of the diner that they first started fighting oh, is outside this the, of. is this the mob boss guy that comes it in? It is the mob boss. Okay. So this guy who owns the restaurant, his name is Lou, he comes down and starts talking to tyler he's like what are you guys doing this is my restaurant get out of here yeah it and- turns out that the tyler had a deal with like, the bartender who ran the place mm-hmm. but he's not here tonight so the, the the boss man who actually owns the joint comes in and yeah and he basically tells him get the hell out of here and tyler tells him like no we really need to use this place so he starts getting tyler starts getting beat up by the bar or the yeah the bar's owner and it's i love the little comedy beats in this scene where he's he's like all right, do you understand me now? As Brad Pitt gets punched in the face, he's like, nope, not quite getting it. And he just keeps on doing that like three or four times. But then eventually, the best way I could describe it is he goes full psycho mode, like Joker levels of messed up here. And he just grabs Lou, throws him down to the ground, starts spitting his blood all over his face and telling him how much he needs to let them have their fight club down here and it basically scares Lou to the point where he just says yeah sure like take it just don't don't come at me anymore man i'm <laughs> terrified and i think this scene is so super important to the movie because i feel like this is the singular scene that really mythologizes tyler durden to the rest of the fight club members 
it oh, makes yeah. it so that he is beyond just a normal guy he is like their cult leader and they are willing to do whatever he says oh yeah when we cut to like other cells of fight club and around mm-hmm. the country and they're talking about tyler Durden, no one's like met him they don't know what he looks like they just but they, just, they talk about him like oh, he's got superpowers he does this yeah he doesn't sleep he doesn't you know he does this you know, he 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 gets reconstruction surgery every three <laughs> months or something like that. Yeah, just all these crazy rumors. So it's, it's this cult of personality. And eventually, mm-hmm. when um, Edward Norton runs into Meatloaf, who was one of the guys at the uh, support group meetings at the start of the movie, mm-hmm. uh, who doesn't have his testicles anymore. Um, well, I mean, can we? Can we? Are we allowed to say the phrasing that they use to describe Bob? I mean, yeah, we're in context. He's bitch tits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Bob has bitched it. <laughs> um, it turns out he's already a part of the Fight Club. Uh, so, again, this ties back into the idea that other people who were going to these meetings have also pivoted to going to Fight mm-hmm. Club instead. Um, well, the men anyway, obviously. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, like that, that sets that up. And then there's a pivot point where, like, all of a sudden, Brad Pitt is now recruiting people to be because yeah, because obviously he said he's given out homework and it's really simple things there's a montage of them like breaking like you know aerials on top of rooftops and like doing some graffiti mm-hmm. little things like that that aren't huge deals but then it escalates to like breaking into stores and they're using magnets and all the dvds and they're yeah. <laughs> they're blowing up the computers in the apple store or whatever it is and mm-hmm. it keeps escalating and then we get to this point where people are like auditioning to be like actual soldiers for him by proving mm-hmm. that they want it bad enough by just standing outside even though they keep getting told to go away and they're standing and they're all wearing black you know t-shirts and trousers they're all like dressed up as if they're a part of like a squad and it becomes it starts to become clear that brad pitt's like training them and he's talked throughout the movie about knowing how to make explosives and stuff like that so it's like yeah okay this this feels like and this is where like every time i've seen this movie where when we get to the point where Edward Norton's waking up in the house and he goes around the house that he's living in with Brad Pitt and he's, he looks around and there's all these guys in black like making explosives and doing whatever mm-hmm. else where I'm just like what is this movie turned into? It, yeah. Do you know what makes me, th- makes me think of obviously this example didn't exist back then when this came out but it makes me think a little bit of how I feel when I saw Darren Aronofsky's mother uh, where there's a point in that movie where things just keep changing and it's like, oh, oh, and this isn't as ba- like extreme as that, of course, because this only yeah. just has this one jump. But in that movie, like because reality's starting to warp and stuff, like she's going through the house and like there's like people there, and then there's like a war happening, and then there's something else. And I remember being really just kind of like not into that because it was like almost almost dream logic to a point. Um, mm-hmm. But this idea that for for Edward Norton, this is kind of starting to come as like a surprise that this is like progressed into what it is, and. Mm-hmm. I think for me as well as an audience member, I'm kind of watching it. I'm going, I just like, what are we doing now? What, what, what is this turned into? Like we're, we're now, now this is like, this has become Tyler Durden is going to do something that's basically a terrorist act. And yeah. Edward Norton has to figure out what it is and maybe try and stop it. And obviously mm-hmm. mixed in with all that, find out that he's the same person and that, that that's the like yeah. element of it. Mm-hmm. So you've got all that at play. I mean, I agree. I think that it is a major tone shift and it kind of feels like it comes out of nowhere because the only bridge between it is this montage of like the homework slowly mm-hmm. escalating or I say slowly, quickly escalating. Um, but I I don't really mind it from the perspective of the narrative of the film because obviously Tyler has had these very nihilistic, destructive ideas the entire time. He's been very much this idea of tear it all down and start over mm. because it's just, we've reached the point where it doesn't work anymore. And honestly, looking back on this nowadays, especially after we've had things in American politics like January 6th and whatnot, where normal people are pushed to these extreme results just via the cult of personality. And that's with a 70-year-old run at it. What could someone like Tyler with this drive and determination to get this stuff done really accomplish and i think that it seeing it in modern context it makes sense that these people who joined because they have this deep unsettling feeling of there's something in their life is not right and this guy telling them here's what you do to fix it i i see this happening pretty much as described in movie i could easily see them falling under tyler's sway 
yeah, I want to make it clear though, nothing what I said though was a critique of the believability of it. It's more just no, a, a tone shift and just like, what is this now? Because, I was just elaborating on yeah. my own thing because I agree with the tone yeah. shift. Because cause, cause you're right, like if you compare this to January 6th, like it's not the exact same obviously, but you can totally mm. see the parallels there. And I'm, so, I, like, yeah, I think it's fair to say that the psychology and the the ideas that it's playing with, like it's clearly hitting on some things that are true to like how people can be influenced and how mm-hmm. these ideas spread and how certain groups will start to believe in really toxic ideas because it, it boasts it, it tells them that they're better because they want to think they're better and that we're mm-hmm. important and that we can do this we can do that that we should be back I mean, on top and yeah that, that's him, what this thirst is it's this thirst to fulfill that yeah him pulling all of these people to live in the same house is basically just creating their own echo chamber it's making yeah. it so they're isolated from everyone else. And he is literally, as they work, out on a megaphone, just reading off his manifesto, saying all the reasons why the world is so crap. Yeah, and obviously you go back to the start of the movie, and it's about being a slave to consumerism. And mm-hmm. the idea that Edward Norton literally says that, oh, my life was almost complete because I'd filled my apartment with all the furniture I wanted from, from yeah. Ikea. You know, I had a complete set of everything. Well, I was done. Like, I, like, I, yeah. What would I do? It's time for retirement now. I've done it. Yeah. I've, 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 I've completed the set. So, I, I think you know those ideas. Like, I've never had a problem with the ideas in this. Never. Mm. It's never been an idea problem. Um, but anyway, we should we should talk about the uh, the big reveal of yes. like uh, how he finds out because basically Tyler disappears. It's, it's basically after Edward Norton first really starts to challenge him. You know, because, mm-hmm. you know, Brad Pitt, is it after he uses a gun on the guy, or is it a little bit later than that? No, the gun is during the, like, homework projects okay, okay, yeah, and yeah, such yeah. like that. And then there's the car scene. Okay, his, actually. Like, him letting go of the So, wheel. I remember, okay, so, he is surprised to find, because he walks in and they're all watching the news, and the police commissioner's talking about this act of, because they've basically set fire to part of a building to make a big uh, smiley face. Yeah. And he's like, wait, did you guys do this? Like, what the hell? You know, um, and then this commissioner's like, oh, we're going to investigate this. This has got something to do with an underground boxing ring. There's this group mm. of people. We're going to investigate it thoroughly. And the next part is Brad Pitt taking the crew, because uh, he worked in a hotel part-time earlier on where he was pissing in the punch um, as part of what he does. I, I do love later on when he, you were saying that one of the waiter comes up and says like, oh, everything is free. And he happens to be with Marlo at that point. Marlo orders a whole bunch of stuff. And as the waiter walks away, he's like, uh, excuse me, clean food? And the waiter <laughs> stops and is just like, okay, then maybe don't get the clam chowder then. <laughs> How much jazz is in that clam chowder? I'd imagine at least 30%. But... <laughs> um, yeah. Which, by the way, she orders like three full breakfasts. Like... Well, she's she's built up the entire time of just being this opportunist and oh, someone yeah, yeah, yeah. who like, takes advantage of other kindness. Of, she's going to get everything on the house for free. She's going to get everything on the house. I, I, I was just sort of thinking, like, I can't, I can't eat all that. How's this, how's this woman half my she's size? She's home leftovers. She's getting boxes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's this whole plan where they're in the hotel and they basically get this police commissioner in the bathroom. They pin him down and Brad Pitt threatens, threatens him and says, hey, if you don't drop this investigation... We're going to take your balls, and you know, mm-hmm. whips out a blade and all that. And the entire time, Edward Norton's sort of starting to think, you know, this is a bit crazy. Maybe we're going too far. Maybe we're going over yeah. a line here. You know, there's, there's a bit too much to this. And so when Norton actually brings up his concerns and starts to challenge Brad Pitt, they end up in this car accident, which Brad Pitt's driving during this. You know, worth yeah. mentioning. It is. It is also worth mentioning the name of this basically domestic terrorist group is project mayhem mm-hmm. they've officially called it that so yeah um and that, in fact this car scene is one of the times where just every so often whilst edward norton and brad pitt are talking in the front seat occasionally the two guys in the back seat will just say uh you know they'll, they'll respond to what edward norton says by saying mm-hmm. uh that is the goal of project mayhem sir and it'll just kind of the first rule of project mayhem is not to ask questions sir and he's like shut up but they have this accident, and then when he wakes up, basically Brad Pitt's gone. Like, Tyler stops appearing to him. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, as we go on, it becomes clear that Tyler is taking control whenever Edward Norton goes to sleep. And Edward mm-hmm. Norton realizes he's sleeping for longer and longer. The idea being that he's not really going to sleep. He's just switching to Tyler, and Tyler's going up and doing things. Yeah, the, the feeling I got from this transition, though, because the car accident happens, and then he's basically laid down in bed and 
they have a little transition where Brad Pitt walks away and Edward Norton blacks out. And the next time he comes to, everyone in the house is gone. Like everyone mm-hmm. has vacated. Everyone's gone. And it's this idea that it feels as though he is basically been out for like weeks, possibly, or at least days. It, it, feels it, like it, he, it does feel like that, yeah. Um, yeah. But he goes around looking for Tyler. So he starts flying to all these different locations. And I mm-hmm. think when you think retroactively back to how all these cells started, if Tyler started them all, it's like, it just makes sense given when Edward Norton was still doing his job, when he was still flying mm-hmm. to these different locations for accidents, that's probably how he started all these fight club rings. Okay. See, for me, the way I read it is that that period where he was blacked out for like days and or weeks was Tyler running around and oh, no. like going on these places he absolutely was but i think that the clubs had already started before then oh okay right i i, I think these for the, for this all to make sense yeah. in my head i think all those clubs had already started some time ago because there was that part where they were beating up the cars and they were talking about other fight clubs yes. that have sprung up in other yeah. places okay yeah. yeah and the fact that there's one where they, they both claim they didn't start it almost was like opening the door to is there even like more personalities that we're not seeing like are taking I mean, over for me For me, I think this is an important theme of the movie here, is that there are eight rules to Fight Club, and I'm not going to list them all off, but obviously the first rule is do not talk about Fight Club. And he makes a point later on of seeing new faces that people are breaking the rules of Fight Club. Mm. And I think that that's important because it instills this idea of, like, yeah, break the rules. Don't listen to authority. Go out and do something horrible or whatever. And that's instilled in this because even the rules that they lay out um there's one that says no shirts no shoes bob is allowed to wear a shirt primarily because of his bitch tits and they also have a rule of if a person goes limp then the fight is over and we see edward norton's character is going up against jared leto and once he goes limp he keeps going well so it's this thing where well yeah but to be fair to that particular scene that the point Mm -hmm. of that scene is that he has gone over the line and he is clearly letting out his rage um, but I think that it's important to note that most of these rules they lay out are being broken. Yeah. So even then, it's this idea when I'm when it says do not talk about Fight Club. I think these people are going from Fight Club and telling it to their friends in other cities and such. And it's managing to simultaneously spring up new Fight Clubs without the Tyler Durden being present. Possibly, but I also think the the fact that Edward Norton has a job where he's flying around the entire country... I think it makes sense that whilst he was still doing that when Fight Club had started, because the, the mm-hmm. whole thing where he stops his, working at his job doesn't happen until some time passes. Like, it's not like oh, it's yeah. a quick transition. So I mm-hmm. think in that time, the implication I got is that while this was happening, he was starting Fight Clubs in all these other places as Tyler. You know, he was yeah. turning it to Tyler in these different locations, and that explains it. Um, but regardless, um, Edward Norton goes around looking for these you know looking for tyler basically and everyone he talks to is like oh sorry i don't know who that is uh sir and then sir. winks at him um and it's not until he goes to a guy who clearly had a very bad night at fight club uh because mm-hmm. he's in like this neck brace thing now and he's like hey who do you think you're talking to or here he's like is this a test sir he's like no it's not a test who do you think i am <laughs> and he's like mm-hmm. You're Mr. Well, no, Durden, he, sir. He, yeah, he specifically calls out, like, you were here. Not Tyler. You were here, and you were standing yeah. right where you were. Uh, and that's the big moment. And he runs back to the hotel and starts making phone calls and, and whatnot. And it's that night that Tyler comes back and is like, mm-hmm. hey, you broke the rule. You talked to people about me. And, yep. and it kind of it kind of all comes out on the table. And if anything, kind of what you were saying earlier about you wish one or two things were more subtle... I think this is also the same thing here where Tyler kind of just like explains it all where he's like, yeah, you created me to be like the strong personality for all the things you couldn't do. I'm free. Mm. And I'm like, I don't know if you had to spell it out to the audience quite that much. You could, uh, yeah. I mean, I wonder how much the audience really would have gotten it if it wasn't spelled out. It's one of those things where because it was spelled out, we don't know how much less they could have said. I think that it did a good enough job, because obviously Tyler throughout this movie has just been sharing every little bit of his manifesto. I think it makes sense in the movie that he specifically says, like, here is why you made me, because you are pathetic, and just lays it all on a table. I I think it may have been powerful if he never admitted that he wasn't real until maybe at the end when Edward Norton holds a gun to his own head. Maybe that could have been Mm. an interesting thing to play with. 
Um, yeah. Or something, I don't know. But regardless, uh, like, from this point on, it's like, okay, he's set something up, and he does two things. He goes to Helena Bonham Carter, buys her lunch, as we mentioned, and basically mm-hmm. he says, here's some money, get out of the city. Don't be in any of the big cities, because he knows, he doesn't know how far spread this attack's going to be that has been planned. He just and knows... Also- he Helena Bonham Carter now knows that something is wrong, and that's too much. She's not mm-hmm. allowed to continue living, more or less, and he fears what Tyler will do to her. Yeah, but there's also almost something here I wish they played with more, is that Edward Norton says to her, I can't know where you're going, because if I know, then Tyler will know. Yes. And I almost wish they played a bit more with this idea of, like, how do you combat a rivalry with someone who's also you. I think that's an mm-hmm. interesting thing to deal with, and I almost wish they went a bit in, into that a bit more, but um, mm-hmm. the other thing he does, though, is he goes to the police, and he tries to tell them everything. He's like, hey, yeah. this is what I know, this is the plan, they've made explosives, they're going after all these credit card companies because they want to wipe out the world's debt, and they're forced mm-hmm. to set us all back to zero and cause chaos, uh, you know, because we live in a society, <laughs> as you said. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, though, Three of the four cops in the room turn out to be members of Project Mayhem mm-hmm. <laughs> and say that you told us, sir, that even if you asked us about this, that we should cut off your balls. And he's like, no, no, guys. No, no, no. <laughs> Direct order. <laughs> We're putting a stop See, to this. <laughs> but that's where I think they that's the part where they do actually play with it, where it's not so much the narrator trying to outsmart Tyler. It's Tyler outsmarting the narrator. It's Tyler being like, here's the things I'm probably going to end up saying. And as I say them, don't listen to me. Oh yeah, but I, I, I'm talking about that. Let's actually have the character try and like play with the rules. If the rules are that he can't mm. know things, otherwise Tyler will know. Then what other things can he do to try and ensure that Tyler can't, like, you know, make countermeasures? Yeah, you're right. Like, you know, yeah. Tyler's already thought ahead for some of these things. But well, I, I want I, to see the main character be proactive. I want to see him try and like work well, around see, that's, these limitations. That's the thing is that the entire ending plot of this movie is the main character being reactive because Tyler's plan is already in motion. He's got the bombs planted. They're going to go off tonight. Like there's nothing he can do to stop the bombs from being planted. It's only trying to react. And oh, stop. I get that. I'm just saying I would have liked it more if, if he oh, yeah, that's fine. actually it would just require a to... full restructuring. Well, not full restructuring, just like, you know, try and like deal with like, figure out what Tyler's done and try and stop it in a way that like he can't combat. Right. You know, mm. like, maybe it would have been more... Like, I get why thematically it makes sense that ultimately he just has to kill Tyler by, mm-hmm. you know, shooting himself in the mouth. Like, I get the thematic kind of, like, big, you know, bombastic emotional endpoint and why you're yeah. doing that. But maybe it would have been kind of interesting if he did do something that Tyler didn't know about and he brings it up in the the, the final scene. Or, not that he did it, but he maybe he asked someone else to do something, but without telling him exactly what he was going to do or, or something. I don't know. Yeah. Just trying like that that could have been almost a way to still still play into the themes where you have this idea that tyler always has the upper hand because he's the stronger one because he's the masculine one right Mm. what if the narrator character what if he found a way to challenge that masculinity in a way that you know like you know like no, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm proposing things that would have made the final like 10, 15 minutes more interesting to me. Because so I, I think the fact that he basically ends this by killing them, like I get mm-hmm. why thematically you do that, but I almost think it's kind of just a little bit weird narratively to me that no, he I get that, that he yeah. ends him with basically a final show of masculinity, which is you know killing him. Like I almost think it would be more interesting if he rejected the masculinity and beat him with something that was the opposite, I guess. So, yeah, so twofold. I didn't see it as much as masculinity because if you really look at it, he puts the gun into his own mouth, which makes it seem like more of an act of cowardice than masculinity. Obviously, he's doing it to kill Tyler, but it makes it, the way it's framed, it's framed as a suicide, more or less. So I viewed it more as an act of cowardice than that. Yeah, which but ties the- into uh, a line that was earlier in the movie, actually, uh, mm-hmm. when Helena Bonham Carter said she was going to commit suicide or try to, and she sort of cracks a almost a dark joke where she's like, I'm not so sure if this is a real attempt or just one of those like you know cries for help kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I think that's a little bit of foreshadowing for, for this moment at the end, is this is the yeah. cry for help, effectively. 
And then in regards to the way that they could, you know, change it up and play with that idea of Tyler knows everything you know, how do you fight against that? Uh, did you ever see the superhero film Push back in 2009? No. So it starred uh, Chris Evans and Dakota Fanning. It's very, very mild spoilers here, but at the end of the movie, the entire focus is that there's a group of people, they have superpowers, and they're all broken down to the very specific classes of superpowers. But the big one is that the villains have a character who's able to see the future. They are able to act as a thing, but it plays off of other people's knowledge. So if other people know what they're going to do, they're able to see the future and map okay. that out. So it's not that you can see the future, it's that you can see what other people are planning to do. Right, and then right. map out exactly what's going to happen from those interactions and reactions. So the way that the characters deal with that is that there's another class of character that has uh, the ability to wipe minds. So they have the main character come up with all these plans, write them all in sealed envelopes, and then has his own mind wiped as well, so that nobody knows the plan until it actually starts going into effect. Okay. Obviously, they can't have him get his mind wiped in this movie, but I do think the idea of, you know, telling someone else, here's a few things you could do, but I'm not going to know specifically which one, so therefore, Tyler would not know either. Okay. I think uh, that might have been a way to deal with that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just spitballing to try and, like, make it appeal to me a bit more, I guess, in the, the final, mm -hmm. like, 15 minutes. Because, you know, I, I get the symbolism of all. He literally kills this other part of himself and, yeah. you know, ends the movie, you know, the destruction of these buildings around him. Like, obviously, it's literally happening in the context of the movie, but it represents, mm -hmm. like, the, the world for him changing as he stands yeah. there with her. And, you know, that's kind of... It's oddly a happy ending, despite the context of everything that's just happened, you know, leading yeah, into him, it. Yeah, him shooting himself in the mouth represents the death of his previous self. And, obviously, the buildings coming down around just... They extenuate that metaphor. They say, like, everything in your life is changing now. Yes. And that is because you have opened yourself up to hell in the bottom carter and have decided to become emotionally available but no i agree that the um the ending kind of loses me a little bit but not so much once he's captured by tyler it's the fight scene leading up to it for me mm. because the entire fight scene is just him getting trounced by tyler because at this point tyler has revealed himself as fully invincible he is unable to be shot, he is unable to be punched, and he can teleport around yeah, I feel because like, he doesn't exist. Yeah, maybe it should have been more of an even fight, I guess. Like, the yeah. idea that he is sort of leveling up to maybe, like, you know, fight back against him and, like, the good side of him all went out kind of thing. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just uh, throwing ideas around more than anything. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because, I mean, that's the thing. The core ideas of what the movie is doing, I know I like those ideas, and I know that mm -hmm. there is a way to do them that really speaks to me and makes me really engaged with the character. And I think that's maybe fundamentally one of the problems I have with this movie is I don't think I connect with the main character. I think mm -hmm. he's... I'm always at, like, a distance. I'm always looking at him as, like, a, a viewer looking at a narrator who's unreliable, as opposed to... I'm connecting with the emotional, like, goals of this character and rooting for him to, like, you know, like, I think if by the end of this movie I was emotionally connected to him and I wanted the good side to beat Tyler Durden's side so that yeah. he could have the happy ending that he gets, I think that could be quite emotionally fulfilling. But I don't think, and because of the way this character is presented to us in this movie is this unhappy guy who's kind of edgy, there's nothing about him to really sympathize with, you know, in a traditional sense. And I think, you know, and I promise I won't bring it back up again, but the TV show that has a lot of these ideas, I think the big differentiator, other than anything else, is that I do very quickly sympathize with that character. In fact, that entire show opens with a scene showing that at his core, that main character, like, there's something you can get behind. And then mm -hmm. even if there is, like, you know, shaky elements later, or there is, like, unreliable things later, there's that baseline the entire time of, like, there's someone good in there that you want to win, that you want to get yeah. better. And I think Edward Norton's character in this, either it's, you know, the script or his performance, they they present me with this guy who I, I just don't feel like I'm rooting for. I don't feel like I'm... I'm like hoping that he gets over his emotional turmoil and has the happy ending. And I think that disconnect 
is probably the biggest problem. But then you add on the stylistic things, the edginess, you know, the stuff for the time period. I think it all adds up to something that I'm kind of, you know, at best lukewarm on, despite the fact that I can recognize the amount of craft, I can recognize David Fincher's effort in mm. putting it all together. I can recognize that there is so much foreshadowing that's being paid off later, which I can compliment and say, hey, that's strong script writing from that point of view. But yeah, yeah. So no, I yeah. I agree. I think that it is very hard to root for the narrator for Edward Norton's character, um, especially because I think for so much of the movie he is essentially just emulating Tyler. He wants to be like him. He wants to do everything he does. And when we finally get the turn to him believing that Tyler has crossed the line and has gone too far, it never really feels like he makes an internal change. It just feels like he's decided this is where the line is and it's not that yeah. he now disagrees with tyler's entire philosophy it's just tyler's taking it too far and it's I, it's I, hard to it's hard to get yourself in the shoes of a character who not 30 minutes prior to this beat the ever-loving crap out of jared leto actually no to be fair i would agree with that <laughs> Never mind. I, I take that away I, th I think um, a good scene to go back to again is the scene where he's with Helena Bonham Carter, mm. tells her to get out of the city, and puts her on the bus, right? That that scene, to me, in theory, should be the scene where you realize he like we should care because he's trying to save someone. He cares about a person's well-being, and that should be the thing we can latch on to as written for him because he's trying to stop all these bad things from happening. Mm -hmm. um, but I think... I never in that scene feel the heart to that. It never feels like a, oh, you know, like he, yeah, no. you know, I never, I never feel like, oh, I'm, I'm connecting to the fact that he really cares about this person, mainly because the relationships throughout the movie has been so, like, uh, aggressive, and for a lot hmm. of the movie, even though it's technically him, it's not actually been him that's been with her. So, the, yeah. the scene, I feel like. They need a scene where they had, like, we, we got to see them as a, a couple first before this scene, I think, to really sell this, that he cares about her getting hurt. You know, I, I think, that, yeah. you know, yeah. No, there's 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 very few points. I, I think the point where they're trying to make that connection is twofold. One, where Helena Bottom Carter shows up and Edward Norton's just drunk and says, Tyler's gone. Tyler isn't here. Thus... I mean, from her perspective, he's having a psychotic break. Yeah. But regardless, he she ends up leaving as if like, and the way it plays out in that scene, as she looks disappointed and sad as she leaves, is that it's supposed to be she came here for him, and yeah. he just is like, oh no, you you sent her away. You told her to leave. She came here but for then, emotional connection, and he immediately just said, no, no, I'm not here anymore. Right. Go away. <laughs> Right, which then, that's the Helena Bottom Carter side. And then what makes it not work is that the only time that we see him make that shift from her, from his side is when he calls her up and says, hey, have we ever had sex? And the moment she says yes, he's like, oh, okay, now I care. It's like, do you? It doesn't feel like you should. Yeah, because, I mean, technically, it was Tyler who had all the encounters with her that were you know mm -hmm. quote unquote romantic if you want to call them that so yeah. and in a weird way like i i know you could say okay when she phoned him or he phoned her i can't remember who phoned her but on mm -hmm. the phone call she says i'm going to commit suicide blah 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 and he just kind of leaves the phone off the hook and goes away the idea that tyler comes up hears more of the phone call and goes to her instead is showing that deep down he does want to go and save her he does want mm -hmm. to go and do something but given everything else Tyler represents in the movie, there's a bit of a disconnect there for me, because that's almost a case of Tyler's actually a good thing in that scene. Tyler's a, a good... Like, because it's, it's, it's the courage to go and save her. Um, yeah. But it's maybe the only positive thing Tyler does in the whole movie. Well, well, let me throw out here. Was it to go save her? I mean, obviously he went over uh, there, but the, the immediately following up on that is an ambulance, a literal EMS crew arrives, and tries to come in and, you know, tell her, oh, it's life worth living, all that. And he just takes her and bails. And the the only reason that she ends up being quote-unquote saved is that he she says, if I fall asleep, I'm dead. You're going to have to keep me up all night long. <laughs> so I don't think that it is really an altruistic okay. reason that Tyler went over. Well, now, but, you're, now that you're saying yeah. that to me, I guess I could read it instead as, 
him taking her away from the you know the medical people showing up to help her is the mm. idea that he wants her to stay as broken as she is because it's beneficial to the right. bad side of the narrator's character that she be broken and vulnerable because that benefits him. Uh, yeah. So that's how you'd read it badly, I suppose. Uh, I could see that. Yeah. I mean, I also think it builds into this idea within the masculinity of, yeah, women are there for our pleasure. Like, it has, like, who cares what they think? They're specifically there. Because when they get back to the house, when they get back to Tyler's house, Tyler is ignoring her 100%. It's only once she brings up the idea of sex that he's like, all right. Let's yeah. go for it. And then the rest of their relationship is built solely around sex. Some sometimes you're phrasing, David, like like I could take some of what you just said out of context. I know. And paste know. it all over the internet. <laughs> I know. You gotta phrase it I, carefully so it can be done. <laughs> I'm willing to hope that uh -huh. you don't. I won't. I'm willing to hope that I'm just... there's you you said it in this this wee way. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, that sounds quite bad if you just snip mm -hmm. that out. No, uh, I got you. But th not to worry, not to worry. I wouldn't dare. I wouldn't dream of it. Um, but anyway, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, like, I hope, I hope I've done a reasonable job of just sort of, like, trying to point out, like, what the movie does that is objectively, obviously solid in terms of construction, but mm -hmm. also make it clear why those things don't work necessarily for me. And some of it is down to taste here, obviously. Like, clearly, right. lots of people love this. Although, I will argue, and Taxi Driver's guilty of this as well, although, when I say that, the fan base of those movies are guilty of this. The movies themselves mm -hmm. are not guilty of this. Um, but the idea that, you know, a, a reasonable portion of the fan base who like the movie like it for the wrong reasons, or at the very right. least, get the wrong message from it. And Taxi Driver is very guilty of that as well. There's people who love Taxi Driver and think that the main character is a hero. He's not. Mm. He is a giant warning sign of what masculinity, the worst parts of masculinity can be. And I think yeah. this movie as well is supposed to be this warning sign of like these like deep ingrained thoughts and how you should be able to navigate them and understand them so you don't you know do extreme things, so you don't fall down a rabbit hole. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the whole mm. thing of, like, the incel circles and stuff like that. They post images of Tyler Durden. They post images of Heath Ledger's Joker. They post images of these people that the movie spends time trying to say, like, no, like, these guys have a point. Like, these, they're, they're played in a way where they have these justifications for these horrific actions they do. And in the terms of the movie... You're supposed to be able to, like, the protagonist wrestles with that. The protagonist is trying to figure out the right way. But the audience should be recognizing at the end of the movie, they're not good people. They are not people that should be emulated, and they need to not be put up on this pedestal. It's the same people that after Infinity War were saying, no, actually, Thanos has a point. <laughs> No, he doesn't. That's the point of it. I love that Joker from Dark Knight was on your list of examples there, just because what you said afterwards applied to everything else. But mm -hmm. I don't remember Batman in that movie wrestling with the idea if the Joker has got a point. I don't think he ever did. I think I think Batman no. was pretty stern against him the whole time. <laughs> I was going more the Two Face thing, but yeah. yeah, yeah. It's um, a, but like, have you? It's you've seen the memes. You've seen oh, yeah, the yeah, images yeah. where it's just their face and then some text that's just like. You, these people really knew what they were talking yeah, about jo jo i mean it was more after uh, walking phoenix's joker but like i definitely mm -hmm. a lot of like oh you know he's kind of got a point you know i was like eh, yeah. no 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 just because the, they are the protagonist of the movie does not mean they are to be emulated they are not yes. to be liked yes Basically, critical thinking and actually reading what the text is saying to you is something that mm -hmm. uh, people should... And that's not to say there's not multiple interpretations of some things, but uh, there is, within reason, clear intent. Um, yeah. So, while we very much disagreed with a couple of things early on in the movie, we were arguing about the meetings and what that represented getting into the rest of the film, the mm -hmm. overall message of the movie is not something we're really debating here. We're, we're pretty much no. on the same lines of, like the overall ideas and what it's sort of trying to warn us about. It's particularly young men more than anything. Yeah, which is why if I could go back and slap 13-year-old self mm. after watching this, however old I was, I would. Because clearly, the, I, I took out of that. I wasn't, you know, fully on board with like, yay, domestic terrorism. But I took on board the wrong messages of like, no, Fight Club is cool. Not yeah. the movie. The concept of a Fight Club is cool. Instead of it being 
the worst possible way to deal with the feelings yes, of yes. an edgy 13-year-old. Yes, the idea of Fight Club is not cool. That's the whole point of the movie. So uh, yep. uh, learn your lessons, people. Uh, <laughs> which I guess gets us to rating the movie, and I don't even know how I'm going to tackle that, but you have to go first, so that's okay. Oh, good. <laughs> Great. I mean, I'll go ahead and say I know I'm going to be higher than you because mm -hmm. it's not so much, like I said, I don't at this point care about the character of Tyler Durden. I don't really care about the ideas he exposits. I don't care about the twist either. What this movie now is to me is this deeper reflection on how do you come to terms with who you are as a person? How do you come to terms with being able to open up emotionally in a world where opening up emotionally is really, really hard to do and is often even looked down upon. It's it's a great view in that sort of perspective. Obviously, it takes a lot of time being edgier than it probably should be, but I think that it only adds to the points it's trying to make by the end mm -hmm. to show how easy it is to backslide into this emotionally closed-off space and let out your frustrations in the world in an unhealthy way. So overall, I think this movie does a good job exploring those themes. It's a uh, very stylistic film, as we said before. I'd say I'd probably... I'm going to say 9. I'm going to say 9. It was between an 8.5 or a 9 for me, but I think that if you told me, hey, do you want to watch this or 7, I'm probably equally torn, and I did give that one the 9 as well. So, yeah, I'm going to go with 9. Okay, so... Um, nah, bring, for, for, bring it down! For, first of all, I will say this movie's two hours and 20 minutes. Now, maybe it's just because mm -hmm. I'm not that into it, but I, that did feel... I felt the runtime watching it okay. today. So I'll mention that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I do think it's edgy. I do think the... the I, I don't really get into the main character's plight, um, so I don't necessarily get have any feelings about him like finally getting to his end point at the end of the mm. movie. Uh, I don't like a lot of the style of the film, uh, and that goes for the editing style in places. It also definitely goes for those weird CG moments where it's like, hey, I want to do a fancy shot where it zooms into something and shows you Yeah, I, I, I never brought up my thoughts on the CG, less to say I agree with you. Yeah. I think that this, this movie was just on the cusp of being able to use the CG properly, but it was just a bit too early. Uh, so as far as rating goes, um, you know, our, our, our bonus episode over on Patreon, we did the game and I was mm -hmm. not fond of that movie either, actually. No. Um, and you, you weren't exactly super positive either, but we were kind of lukewarm to, to negative yeah. on that. Um, I do think I'll rate this higher than that. So I'll probably give this a six, which is to basically concur and agree that it has technical qualities and even the style mm -hmm. that i don't like i at least appreciate that there is a style and that he's going for something that this is not just fincher making mistakes he is mm -hmm. making something he's got a vision and he's sticking to it and i can appreciate that i just don't like a lot of it um that's fair that's conceptually fine. you know I, I concepts are fine but i don't like a lot of what the actual execution is so uh, for me, 6 out of 10. It's higher than the game, because unlike the game, I do think this at least has a message. It's saying something, and mm -hmm. it's it's got a kind of... A, it feels like it's got a purpose. Whereas the game feels like... It feels like a, a pot boiler. It's like, this is just a story, for because we want to do a fun story. Which is fine, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that, but it's also mm -hmm. not that good, so... <laughs> but, yeah, I th I think for me, like you, like I said, this movie hit me at... You, you said when you watched this in your teens, you weren't that fond of it back then either, right? No, no I never so, was. I think that was kind of why this one kind of stayed with me is that I more or less followed the plot of the narrator here in terms of, I think Fight Club's really cool, and then I grew out of it. And then mm. I realized there are healthier ways to deal with it. So I think it might have just hit a bit harder for me in that I was that same sort of mindset and I got out of it when I realized there's better ways to do this. Yeah. Um... So there you go, that's Fight Club. Yeah. Now, obviously, you know, if you're, if you're following Fincher season and you're, and you're a patron and you've seen the bonus episode, I've been kind of negative on two in a row. Yeah. Don't worry, I do like <laughs> other Fincher movies. And, uh, you know, hopefully next time, I believe it's Panic Room next, uh, yep. we'll be looking at that. Uh, but it is worth mentioning uh, the bonus content you get on Patreon. The, the regular monthly bonus episode is actually stopping um, 
soon. Uh, November will be the last one. Uh, yes. But the Criterion cut, the show mon- we do monthly where we do a Criterion uh, movie, will be going Patreon only, and that'll replace the regular bonus episode. Uh, so the the last three ones in November, the first Patreon one will be in December, I believe. And mm. that's uh, coming up. So I'll mention that to promote that. And also our $5 and up bonus show, uh, Extra Reels, Collector's Cut Extra Reels, is the opposite of the Criterion show. It's <laughs> us reviewing the worst of the worst. Hopefully having fun, but yeah. not always, as some no. may be. So, yeah. Um, Before we move on too far, we do have to establish, uh-huh. does this film make the cut? Oh. And I, I think I might actually have to fight you on this. You tell me where you're thinking. I will agree to cutting it close. Cutting it close? I will agree to that. That's not where I want to put it. <laughs> oh, really? God. Because I'm, I'm, I'm full on saying making the cut. I think that it's I'm, proven itself enough over time. Of well, being I want to a... say not making the cut. So how's the compromise? <sighs> I've given up so much to you <laughs> in this category before. That I kind of just want to pull it out and say, no, we're I going with this. I really but don't like fake love. I know, I know. Just, <laughs> I, I, you know what? I have learned that fighting is not the right <gasps> way to deal with these things. I can deal with the compromise. We will say cutting it close. And that's how is you win. Is this acceptable? That's how is you win, good? ladies and gentlemen. Yep. To quote Adam Sandler, this is how I win. <laughs> but I am gonna put a little star next to it just to represent like <laughs> this is this is the time where I've given up to Pete, so all right, all I right. I can pull it out later. All right. Uh, when okay. I wanna say when I wanna say that Benjamin Button should be a cut above. If you think that we've got bigger problems than <laughs> <laughs> disagreements. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> you've got bigger problems t- than that. Uh yeah, so yeah, that, that, that's that's the stuff worth worth mentioning here. Um, so, where, where? Oh, okay. I'm confusing myself. Doesn't matter. Anyway, that's the show, everyone. <laughs> that's been yep. that's been uh, Fight Club. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, let us know what you thought of the movie in the comments. I'm sure you all disagree with me. That's fine. That's okay. We'll move on. Hey, I've been wrong before, occasionally. You've been wrong repeatedly, multiple times per episode. How dare you? This is actually the <laughs> farthest we've split on scores oh, yeah. over the it. course of our entire show. And notably created the numbers six and nine next to each other. Nice. Hey! Uh, but that is the show. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you can, of course, uh, like, subscribe, all those things help as well. As obviously, go over to patreon.com slash TV. But uh, that is us. So thank you once again for watching or listening. We always appreciate it. Keep watching movies and... <sighs> Turns out you can use the fat of rich people who got liposuction to make explosive devices. I wouldn't know how. I would not look up because I don't want to be put on a list. But fat kills in more ways than one.